I have been very fortunate to have become the Minister of Education of Thailand many years ago. And at a time, I thought, like many others, that education is broken and we need to fix it. And so many people thought that way. And if you see, then I thought that it's due to the lack of continuity of the leader in education ministry or in, even in the country. Uh, in the last hundred years of the history of Ministry of Education, we have had 55 ministers of education in the last 90 years. So I thought maybe it's due to continuity. Maybe it's due to policies. Maybe it's due to politicians. Maybe it's due to assessments, curriculum, all sorts of reasons. But then you wonder, so many people have tried to fix education system, and it has very little results. So far, we have found that most school reforms, not only in Thailand, but around the world, actually have failed. So I thought, What's the reason behind this? Again, people keep doing the same things again and again and again. Until I realized, as many other people thought again, that Thailand's education is not competitive enough. And how can we improve the competitiveness? Because of that, I actually went to Harvard Business School and then learn, and then come to a realization that in fact, we don't need to reform education. The system works really well, as it is designed to do so. It's working wonderfully well. Then you have to find a reason why it's working so well. So the system is not broken. The system is working really well. So we should not attempt to continue to reform education. Schools are designed to produce mass followers. That's for sure. People in the ministries follow the minister. The minister follow the prime ministers. The teachers follow the policies set out by the officials. The officials follow, again, the higher ranking officials. And students go there and then follow the teachers. And if you look at it, after the students come out to work, this is probably you, your experience as well, they behave exactly the same way as when they did in their school time. So there's no difference in their behavior because they have been trained so well. They have been trained so well, then we will see that it's very difficult to shift their mindset, their character, their behavior, because they have been trained to be experts in being followers. Then I came across the idea of competitiveness, that you can have many different levels of competitiveness at the firm level, at a country level, at a firm level, when we say a firm or an organization or a company is competitive, we mean that they are very profitable. They, they have the engines to continue to make profit. When we say a country is competitive, we mean actually the country is very productive. So when we talk about the individual level, that an individual is competitive, usually it means that the individual is very competent and has good character. I learned this from Harvard Business School, the Institute of Strategy and Competitiveness by Michael Porter. So when you use this framework to analyze education industry as a whole, what they call 
what Michael E. Porter calls five competitive forces in education. The way we analyze the education industry is very simple. When we think about the industries, we do not think about the existing schools, incumbents, or the rivals. You know, schools should be compete with one another, but also we think about potential new entrants. We should think about suppliers, the bargaining power of suppliers. We also should think about the bargaining powers of customers or buyers, and also the substitutes. Then let's have a look at the first force. There are 30,000 schools in Thailand, and we think they're competitive. Are they competing with one another? They're not. Maybe it's due to the geographical distances that they can't compete. You know, Chiang Mai School will not compete with Bangkok School. Even in Bangkok, maybe it's due to policies that we are not competing with one another. So hardly there is any competition. So the first force is very weak among schools. So when the force is weak, it means that the competition is not high enough to produce innovations. The schools just follow the policies. They behave exactly the same way. They produce exactly the same types of products. So the first force, after the analysis, we know that the first force is very weak. That means competition among schools is weak. Let's have a look at the second force. It's obviously very weak. This is the recent photos that we have taken uh, for those who tried to enter Triemudom Siksa. Recently, there was an entrance examination. 10,000 10, students sit there, wanting to get into Triemudom Siksa school. And that illustrates that the bargaining power of students is very weak. You can't demand anything. In fact, it's them who select you. They demand a lot of conditions. So we, as buyers, if you like, or customers, or to put it nicely, students and parents, we have a weak bargaining power. We look at the supply size. The teachers, the politics, they have very strong bargaining power. They can, they have union, they have association, the politics of it, the politicians who dictate the policies, they have the power to reward you or punish you if you don't follow them. So the bargaining power of the teachers and, and, and the politicians and policy makers is very strong. You look at potential new entrants, very hard because of the high barrier, because of the regulation. It's very difficult to allow uh, new entrants to come in. When I was a minister, it was very difficult to get foreign universities, particularly good universities, to come in. For instance, Carnegie Mellon wanted to come in for a long time, for many years, but with the existing regulations, they could not. In the end, I had to, with the Prime Minister, had to use a special law, Section 44, to allow Carnegie Mellon to come in and set itself up in Thailand. So there's a strong barrier. That means the force is weak. Substitutes. People have been saying, let's have substitutes for formal education, maybe online, maybe, you know, non-degree courses, but so far, they cannot provide adequate substitutes. The buyers do not like substitutes. There's more or less supplementary rather than being substitutes. So the force of substitutes is very weak. So taking Porter's five competitive forces, you can see when looking at it, we can now understand why Thailand education is not competitive. And we understand why it is designed to work so well. 
because it's working so well to serve the big box there, the strong bargaining power of teachers, politics, but the rest of the forces in competition are very weak. Now, so children have been trained 20,000 hours. If you count all the hours they spent, all the hours they spent from primary school onwards until they finish higher secondary schools, they would have spent about 20,000 hours. It's enough to make you an expert twice because the rule of thumb for be, becoming an expert is that you should spend at least 10,000 hours to polish, to hone your skills of anything. So you have great opportunities. Our children have great opportunities to practice being great followers or good followers. So they have been spending that time. So no matter what schemes you try to put in, or you may have leadership courses, you may do this and do that, it has very, very little indent or impact on the system. You know, a few hours, even a week, to try to do leadership courses or even with some somewhat good curriculum will not be enough to actually make an inroad to disrupt children being expert in becoming followers. Because we have successfully trained them to be followers. So, according to Michael Porters, what can we do? He basically says, if you analyze the five forces that we see now, the only chance you can make an inroad into the system and to make some parts of the system more competitive or actually your schools more competitive is to have strategy. You should have strategic positioning. To have a strategy means you, this is again Porter's teaching, that the schools, the potential new entrants, have to be able to create unique competitive position by doing things differently. Unless we do things differently, the new entrants will be exactly the same. When they come into the system, they follow exactly the same uh, policies, the same ways of uh, delivering education as their current rivals. So in, after I stepped down, I had a chance to get into trying to do something strategically about education. Now that I know that in order to change the system, the structure is almost impossible. Now that I know that the only way to make a difference is to have a school that is strategic enough to offer different values. So in our Newton group, we hope to offer values in these four dimensions. The overall, the overall philosophy for us is to do fewer things with greater depth. Michael E. Porter often says that the essence of strategy is choosing what not to do. Many people like to do a lot of things here and there. I mean, Warren Buffett also says the difference between successful people and very successful people is that very successful people say no to almost everything. So in Newton, in our group, our schools follow this principle. The skills. Again, in order to be competitive, if you look at the larger scheme of competitiveness, it's not general education that counts. It's specialized education. Our students are old enough to do specialized education, be 
they business schools, be they computer science schools or AI, or art and design, or even following the traditional tracks like medicine, dentistry, and so on. So we focus on this, the skills, the specialized skills, English. And it's, I think it's widely accepted that one of the reasons our country cannot be competitive is that our English ability is not that great. Ethics. Ethics, there are different approaches to ethics. So how do we develop ethics in students differently from others? And knowing. Knowing usually starts, people think knowing is knowledge, but it, it should start with know who. Know who is, doesn't mean that you should be associated with famous people, celebrities, but who do you learn the skills from? We should be with masters in the field who really have a good relationship with us. We should, because only then can you learn to master the skills. You can't learn it from books. For instance, leadership, you cannot learn it from books. The know-how and the knowledge. So we want to, and in fact we should, spend 20,000 hours at our disposal to develop good leaders and good followers in our schools. So far in the last two years, we have tried this idea in action. We have spent about 3,000 hours in action in our group of schools. And you see them in action after my talk. Thank you very much.